<laughs> thank you, and thank you again for the invitation and for organizing this 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 series. I think it's super super relevant also to help bridge the gap between research and and policy making in in Latin America. So I'm going to be talking about criminal, as Helke mentioned, I'm going to be talking about criminal participation and, and violence among, among youth. I'm now actually on leave from, from Colombia. I'm at INSPER in, in Sao Paulo uh, right now, so I'm in, I'm in Brazil at this very moment. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be talking mostly about a paper that I wrote with, with Leandro Carvalho that, that um, addresses the issue of, of criminal participation in gangs in, in Rio de Janeiro. But before that, I'm going to start a little bit with a, with a slightly broader overview of, uh, of the issue of, of, of youth and crime, right? That I think there are some, some more general issues, some important general issues that actually interact with the, with the issue of gang participation. Right, so I'm an economist, so I'm coming out of the, from from a, a perspective of economics of crime, and uh, when we we look at the data, when we look at the correlates of uh, the socioeconomic correlates of of crime, at the individual level, we typically see that uh, there is a very close relationship between several types of family decisions and participation of youth into crime, right? So we see that schooling and quality of schooling and early childhood investments. So all of these actually end up being, being related to long-term criminal participation. Uh, this is partly related to the issue of access to, to, to uh, jobs in the legal labor market. And uh, uh, also related to the point that we have this uh, more aggregate socioeconomic conditions that also seem to be closely related to, to, to criminal participation. So legal labor market opportunities, social protection mechanisms. And, uh, and I, I have a paper with Laura on that, for instance, right on conditional cash transfers in crime. And uh, so we, we uh, in, in some sense, all of these dimensions, they fit very well with, the, with kind of a more rational choice uh, interpretation of criminal participation by individuals with better labor market opportunities in better in better times they are less likely to be committing crime they are less likely to be involved in crime when labor market opportunities are worse or when individuals are, are, are less productive they, they have less access to formal jobs they are more likely to be engaged in crime and all of that uh, works well let's say from a more uh, rational choice perspective as I mentioned before but at the same time, I mean, there are some dimensions over which this simple economic story does not seem to tell, to be able to account for, for everything that we observe, right? And I think youth is a particular case, a particular group for which uh, this perspective kind of falls short, right? So the first uh, kind of stylized fact that we have and that it's more or less the same across different societies that actually youth typically account for a disproportionate share of the perpet uh, perpetrators of violence, right, of criminal involvement, right? So in the U.S., for instance, teens between 15 and 19, they account for 20% of arrests for violent crimes. They are uh, much less than, than the share of the population. Uh, in based on the data from the from the paper that I have with Laura from some years ago, if you look at minors in the case of São Paulo, Brazil, they account for 20 to 25 percent of the of, of suspects for robberies and thefts, uh, including auto thefts. Also, this is a disproportionate, uh, more than proportional representation, right, among 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 this group. At the same time, we also know that youth. They are also a disproportionate share of the cost of crime and violence. This is partly because we know that individuals that are involved in crime and violence, they are typically also the, those at the higher, at higher risks of being victims themselves, right? And maybe the most striking, the most striking uh, way to see that is, is the age-specific homicide rate, right? So what we have here is the age-specific homicide rate from Brazil, Colombia, and the US, this is actually from the 90s, and I, I'm using the 90s just because Colombia had much higher levels of violence in the 90s, and this actually highlights like countries, three countries with diff very different levels of violence at that point in time, still this age profile is present in all of them, right? So at late teenage years, 
we see that exposure to violence increases dramatically and really very, very quickly, and then starts coming down afterwards. And by mid four, it's, it's already typically less than half of it used to be. And this is true for what Colombia was in the 90s, that was extremely, extremely high violence levels for, let's say, high violence levels, but at, at a lower, uh, not, not as extreme as violence as, as Colombia was at that point. That was the case of Brazil in the mid 90s. And that the same profile was also, was also true for the US. So this is very general. This actually links to to a documented pattern in the in the criminal psychology literature. That's what, what typically people call the life cycle pattern of antisocial behavior, right? And this relates to different types of crime or even, even go beyond crime, uh, therefore the term antisocial behavior more generally, right? There are evolutionary psychology and criminal psychology theories that try to explain this pattern but this pattern is basically a reproduction of the of this pattern of homicides that I showed before for other types of violence, right? So this figure is basically kind of uh, portraying the same profile for robberies and bur burglary and aggravated assault for the case of, of, of the US. And you have you have always this life cycle profile that's very, very steep. Uh, it starts with late teenage years, it peaks depending on the type of crime at late teens or early 20s. And then it starts coming down to much lower levels uh, in the in the mid mid forties already, right? Um, this is true in different societies. This has been documented in all sorts of societies. There are some kind of biological explanation. Suppose that uh, people have presented biological explanations for these. Other people have presented anthropological explanations for this. I don't know. I don't think we we fully understand. Uh, what is behind it yet, but it is a, is a very general pattern of involvement in crime and violence um, that is, and I forgot to mention, is, is, is particularly salient for males, right? And so it's, it's much, much more extreme for males than for females. And mo most of what I'm gonna be saying here applies particularly for males, right? Uh, for the same reason, we also tend to think of education, of schooling, as having an incapacitation effect as we think of incarceration as well, right? So the papers by Jacob and Lefkin or Bertel and Kruger also show that when you keep teenagers in school, you tend to avoid certain types of, of crime in school surroundings just because they're actually in school and not, they're not elsewhere doing, doing other nasty things. And then Jacob and Lefkin, if I remember correctly, they also show that they tend to fight more inside schools when you, when you bring them together, right? So uh, there, there are uh, all of these dimensions and they are particularly salient, as, as we mentioned before, in, in teenage years, right? And part of this access in, in violence among teens is, a, so, is typically associated with participation by different types of groups, right? Sometimes these groups can be legal. So for instance, uh, in groups of soccer fans in Europe and South America, there is typically a lot of violence associated with that. Sometimes these groups are gonna be informal, just local cliques in the neighborhood. And sometimes these groups are gonna be explicitly criminal. This would be the case of the, of the gangs in 1980s LA and until today, the, 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 the pandillas and mares in Central America and also in, in nowadays in US Latino neighborhoods uh, and the gangs in, in the favelas of Rio, right? And for obvious reasons, the information on these types of organizations is very, very scarce, right? We know very little about the individuals who participate in them, exactly what their trajectory within these this, this organizations uh, is and, 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 and the typical outcomes over time for these individuals. There are a lot of ethnographic study on this group. So for the US, I'm listing a couple. So Levitt and Bank Katesh have a couple of papers. Moore has a, 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 a famous study as well on drug, on drug trafficking. Rubio has a, a very impressive work on, on, uh, on, on, on mapping the participation of youth in Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Panama in, in these groups. And, and, and Doudney also did some anthropological work in, in Rio. Uh, followed a couple of years later by, by the questionnaire that we're going to be using, which is basically data from this Observatorio de Favelas in Rio, 
uh, which basically translates as Islam Observatory, which is an NGO um, based in, in, in Rio with very close contact with, uh, with, uh, with the populations living in the, in, in the favelas, in the Islams of Rio, of Rio but abusing favelas uh, throughout. And this is basically what this paper that is already has been published some years ago, but I was, I was glad to, to be provoked by Chris to bring it back to life a little bit and explore a little further uh, its, uh, its results. That's basically what we did in this paper. So this paper is joint work with Leandro Carvalho, who is, uh, who is at the University of Southern California. Um, and, and basically what we do is to take the data from, from this survey that was conducted by this NGO and, and, and conduct some, some what, we, what we hope to be some sensible statistical and econometric analysis on this data and also some comparison with the Brazilian census, right? Um, a similar survey was conducted again in 2017. I haven't looked very closely at that at data and uh, I don't think anybody has, has gone back there to, to, to see how, how things change, right? Of course, I mean, the, the NGO has a, has a report on these and so on and they, so they obviously looked at the data, but I think a more systematic statistical analysis of this 2017 data hasn't been done yet. So a very, very brief description of the survey itself and, uh, and its advantages and disadvantages. So it's basically a survey of 230 individuals, almost all of them males, that worked for the drug trafficking business in, in Rio in 2004, right? Uh, it looks very much like a household survey. So they have demographic data, they have family characteristics. And then the interesting part is that they have a lot of information about involvement into crime and actually the actual job that people perform in these organizations, what they do, how many hours they work. So it's, like, it's really like a, a, a labor market survey for gang members to some extent, right? Uh, they, 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 they made some effort actually to follow these individuals over four months after the initial survey, but it's very, very poor, this, the, the follow-up. So basically we, our initial intention was also to look at that, but it wasn't really usable. So less than half, I mean, much less than half of the sample they, they were able to locate and very, in a very, very sketchy way, right? And after two years, they went back and tried to find these people and look for also for death records and contacted family members to know what had happened to them and, and so on and so forth. So the advantages are pretty clear. I mean, this is like having a, a labor market survey, as I mentioned before, a demographic and labor market survey as of gang members. The challenge obviously here is sampling, right? How you actually get to this to these individuals. So as I mentioned before, this NGO is, is it, it has a it, its origin. Uh, actually is in the in the favelas of, of, of Rio. So they are they have a lot of, uh, of uh, trust from from the local communities and that's what, what they use to, 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 to reach these gang members, right? But obviously there's no way of, of doing that in a random way, right? Of mapping all gang members and just selecting a random sample of this. So this was what typically people call like the snowball sampling scheme. So they had 10 interviewers that themselves had previous relationship with gangs. These interviewers actually looked for people that they know that were involved in gangs in different communities, in 34 communities spread across the city. And through the people that they contacted, they reached other people, right? So that's basically the, the logic of the sampling and the big drawback of this data. So the statistical limitations are pretty obvious, but at the same time, uh, information on these groups and on the people working for them is so scarce that we, we did believe at that point, and I still do believe that they, they do provide a pretty unique insight despite its limitations, or the data that provides a pretty unique insight despite it, its limitations. We're gonna do very little about the statistical limitations of representativeness. Uh, uh, we're gonna just treat it as a sample of gang members. Most likely, I would say, uh, uh, I would imagine that it's, it's probably pretty decent for, the, for your average gang member, but I would say that probably they had a harder time getting to the higher positions and the guy, the higher position, the manager. So they did interview a couple of managers. I would be very suspicious about the representativeness of these managers, 
but of lower levels individuals, I would guess that probably they, they, they are not very different from the average guys. But again, I mean, this is just, this is just a guess, right? Uh, so I'm gonna start giving a broader review of the sample characteristics in 2004, and then I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the, about the, the analysis that we conducted, and I think the puzzles, uh, the insights and the puzzle that it, that it brings, right? So, so a broad overview of sample characteristics in 2004, first related to individuals and families. So these kids were basically, they were aged between 11 and 24. 40% of them still live with parents. They have an average family size of 2.7 siblings. So it's slightly large for Brazil at that point, I would, I would say it. Uh, uh, 20, 3% of, of, of them claim to have been victims of domestic violence. 10% were still enrolled in school despite being gang members. 92% of the dropouts had dropped out before 16, so at pretty young ages. And actually 60% of them have had a previous legal job. And one thing that was a, a little surprising to us at least is that there, there is a lot of movement at these lower levels. There is a lot of movement in and out. Right? So I don't think there is any trace of the idea that people are, are intimidated uh, into staying in the game, right? They're coerced into staying in the game. I think they can, they can pretty much leave at any point they want and they can come back at any point. So this, it was very fluid, right? Uh, from the data, you can see that it's actually very fluid. In terms of the dra drug trafficking jobs, 66% uh, started working before 15. 58% earned between one and three minimum wages. I'm gonna talk a little more in detail about whether this is high or low and what you should think of it. Uh, and as I mentioned before, 39% had left the drug trafficking business temporarily at some previous point in the past and then joined back again. Because all of these kids actually were working for the drug tra trafficking business when they were in Zerfield. So as I mentioned, it's very fluid, the, the, the movement in and out of it. And then the most striking thing, I guess, from, from, for somebody looking from the outside is the level of exposure and involvement with violence, right? So over 50% of them claim to have been involved in armed, armed con confrontations with police and rivals, meaning really shootouts, basically, right? More than 50% were arrested at some previous point in the past, either, either juvenile or later on. And the, and the thing that really jumps out of it and, uh, is that actually after two years, 20% of them were dead, right? So 35 individuals, roughly 20% of the sample were dead. I mean, there is, there is no, no war that you're gonna have this casualty rate, for instance, right? Like two, two out of 10, right? They may have it in a battle or, or two, but in a, over the course of a war in terms of, of soldiers engaged, I mean, I think if I'm not mistaken, the mortality rate, US mortality rate in the Vietnam over the entire period is below 1%, right? Uh, just to put this number in, in perspective, right? This we're talking about like a two year time frame, right? So it's really extremely striking. So I think the first thing, going back to our original motivation, the, it kind of begs the question of uh, why, are, why do they join? Right? And, uh, and how do they justify uh, the attractiveness of, of this occupation? So part of it has a social economic motivation, clearly. So some of the most common answers was were to make a lot of money, had a hard time finding a job, uh, to help my family. So this adds up to slightly over 60%. But there is a very common, the second most common, uh, most common type of answer, let's say, as carries some, some sort of, uh, I would say, either social or excitement dimension, right? So adrenaline, uh, adrenaline, right, sorry, uh, to hang out with my friends makes me feel powerful. I wanted to use a gun. If you, are, if you add all of those up, which is, I mean, has some dimension of like some perception of coolness or, or, or uh, something along those lines, it actually adds up to roughly 25%. Right? And if you would split it to like socioeconomic uh, motivations and more uh, excitement and coolness motivation, this would be basically the second reason uh, put forth, right? And I think this, uh, it is an important part of this story. Um, to give you a little, bit, a little bit more background on the, on the actual jobs, 
and I'm gonna, I mean, this value is not gonna mean much to you just looking at it. So they earn roughly 30, 300, 300 uh, dollars a month. I'm gonna come back to this to put this into perspective uh, in the next slide. And working schedules are very, we're very tough at that point, right? So they basically claim to work roughly 10 hours a day on average, a number of days off per week, slightly below what? Kind of half a day off per week, right? So uh, to some extent, these guys are just hanging out together all the time and doing their job. I think it's difficult to disentangle exactly what's work and not work because they're just there, right? But it, but it, but it's 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 not light, right? And I mean, it's a it's a heavy work schedule. Uh, roughly half of them say that they work armed every day, and then the numbers that I gave you before, slightly more than fifty percent were arrested in the past. So slightly more than fifty percent were victims of police extortion. Close to seven, more than seventy percent uh, were victims of police violence in the past, right? So. Those are the numbers that I, I had already mentioned uh, before. So what we do in this paper is to conduct some economic analysis that in particular, we actually compare the characteristics of these individuals with 2000 census data. And the census allows you to kind of approximate the population living in, in favelas in Brazil, because it has this category that is subnormal urban agglomerates, which is basically kind of a non a non a non non standard dwelling right in some sense right and it's not exactly restricted only to favelas but it's going to be uh, it's going to approximate it reasonably well and people have used this in the past as a way to to try to understand the the, the characteristics of uh, of the favela population right uh, there are relatively few variables that can be directly compared across the two data sets because of the, the the way that the questions are asked and the, the specific framing, right? Uh, but we actually can compare race, religion, age, education, and earnings. Uh, what we do, the first thing that we do is actually to focus because we have individuals between 11 and 24 in the gang in the gang sample. We focus on men between 10 and 25 in the favelas of Rio, and then just compare to the men, which, which are basically 90, 95% of the sample of gang members. There is like a technical, the, 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 the kind of the most obvious thing that we would want to do first would be just to kind of try to understand the determinants of participation into gangs, right? Just to make like a participation equation, uh, see how race, education, and so on would be related to that. Uh, there is a challenge to do that. It's typically the setting that we have in this case is typically called contaminated sampling. Meaning we have a gang of, of we have a, a sample of gang members, and then we have another sample of individuals living in favelas that come from the census, but we actually don't know who participates in a gang or not in the in the sample from, from the census, right? So this is the context that is, is known as contaminated sample. And Blancaster and Evans, Guido Evans, who just won the, the Nobel Prize a couple of weeks ago, actually have uh, have uh, have an estimator that actually allows you to analyze the determinants of participation in the setting, in this, in this empirical set, right? Uh, in order to do that, you have to know the probability of participation into gangs. And Doudne, which is a, this, this anthropologist uh, who has done some anthropological work in the favelas in Rio, provided some, some informal assessments for this number, right? So that's the first thing that we do. And I mean, I'm not going to go into, into the equations or anything like that. And I mean, but the conclusions are the same conclusions that, that already are, are, are apparent here when we just look at the, the characteristics of the gang members and the, and the kids and the young individuals live, living in the favelas in Rio, right? So curiously, when we did just take this representative sample of the individuals living in the favela, the average age is 17 years old, 17.5, and among the gang members is actually 17.7, I'm sorry, 16.7. So it's really not that different, right? In terms of racial composition, I think the thing that uh, uh, comes out is that gang members tend to be on average more black than the, than the, the average population in the favelas, less light and slightly more black and mixed, uh, I'm sorry, not more mixed, more black actually in particular, right? And this, there's an interesting result that I'm gonna 
come back to in the end that may help explain this. In terms of religion, they, they have a higher likelihood of claiming that they have no religion, a lower likelihood of claiming that they're both Catholic and, and evangelical. Uh, they tend to be, to have a higher probability of being married with it, which also fits well with the idea of these aspirations of helping, of already having independence and, 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 and things of that sort. And they have a significantly higher likelihood of being illiterate, right? And obviously of not attending school, but not attending school can be uh, partly determined, can be endogenous to gain participation. So illiterate should be determined before they are even 11 or 13, 14, which is the most uh, common age at entry. So, so we don't really think of attending school as, as a, a variable that is given at that point in time, but literacy should have been determined, right? And they have substantially higher literacy rates, kind of more than two times higher. Uh, so this is just a comparison of these characteristics, but actually when we do this analysis, the Lancaster and Evans analysis that I mentioned before, the same thing comes out. So gang members are more likely blacks and, and slightly younger, uh, illiterate individuals with no religion are more likely to, to, to be gang members. And also if the family owns a house, they are less likely to be gang members. The family meaning the parents, right? So there, there's a little bit of socioeconomic determinants here as well as I mentioned before. Uh, Rodrigo, just a quick interruption, you have five minutes left. Okay, I think it should be almost okay. Let me see if I can do it. So, <laughs> so when we compare these kids in terms of, of labor market, right? When we compare these kids to the average, so this is the average kids living in the favelas and these are gang members, right? So gang members actually earn a little more than the kids living in the favelas. So it's not substantially more, but it's a little more. At the same time, gang members, have their characteristics in terms of education and so on are worse in terms of in, in terms of labor market than the characteristics of the average kids living in the favelas. So what we do is basically to based on the characteristics of the gang members estimate what would be the wage that they would earn if they were on the labor market, right? And it's actually substantially lower, substantially lower than the average wage in the favelas. Indeed, it's one hundred and forty-five dollars. So so they are earning a decent premium here which is basically they are earning, if you look at youth that are similar to them in terms of characteristics, they're earning roughly two times more than they would in the legal labor market, right? So they're earning a little, a little money. Wage determination, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna go very quickly. So this is basically a wage regression that is basically a way to try to understand the correlates of wage. Who are the people who actually earn higher wages inside the gangs? I'm going to go very quickly and just throw some results that I think are very interesting and striking. Uh, two of them is that basically there does not seem to be discrimination inside the game, right? So blacks do not earn less than whites inside the game. When you look at legal labor market occupations, blacks typically always earn less than whites, even when you consider people of similar characteristics. This is not true inside the games. There's no significant difference across blacks and whites. Another thing that is very striking when you compare to legal labor market data is that there are no gains, there are no returns to education. Returns to education is basically more educated people typically earn higher wages in the legal labor market. Here, there is no significant uh, gains in wages associated with uh, with with uh, with uh, with the illegal occupation, and it's not because it's very noisy. It's basically a zero. It's really a zero. There is no increase in wages associated with education. But wages increase a lot with experience. So this is just years of gang affiliation. So each additional year of gang membership is basically a 10% higher uh, wage, right? And also, if, you, if you've been involved in, in gunfights in the past, if you, if you put yourself on the line, your wage also increases roughly 5% per gunfight, right? So there is something of attachment to the gang being, being, being recognized, right? Um, we also conduct some analysis related to age of entry, being trying to look at correlates of age, of age of entry. So things that are predetermined and whether they are, they, they tend to be associated with early entry into the gang. What is is that kids that are illiterate and kids who start using drugs very early on, uh, they tend to, to, enter, to enter a little earlier. 
uh, it's difficult to, to, to rule out the possibility that these variables are partly determined by gang entry, but illiterate, uh, being illiterate, this should have been determined before age 11 or 12, right? So at least illiterate uh, seems to be, uh, seems to indicate some relationship between problems at school and gang entry. And the last thing, the last result that I'm gonna show is basically the, what I think is the most striking result. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus only on column four here. Uh, this is basically trying to analyze where, whether there is anything that you can see in the questionnaire that is correlated with the probability of death after two years. So these kids actually answered <clears throat> this questionnaire in 2004. We know, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we know that 20% of them were dead after two years. And the question is whether there's anything that they answered in this in 2004 that actually predicts that. And there are some things that pop up in one case or another, whether they were engaged in, in a lot of gunfights before, uh, single mother shows up a little bit, but it's not very robust. But there is one thing that is always present, which is, and I think this is extremely, for me when I saw this, I think it's extremely striking. These kids were basically asked, where, you a problematic kid when you were growing up, right? Did your, I think actually the phrase is more like, did your, parent, did your parents think that you were difficult to handle when you were growing up? So that's what we're calling unruly here. So this is a kid answering his own perception of how he was seen by his parents when he was growing up. The, the kids who actually answered that they, yes, they were seen as being uh, 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 troublesome when they were growing up, they had a 16 percentage point higher probability of being dead in two years, right? So this is, and I think this is, see, this goes back to original, the original point that, that I was making about, uh, about something else actually being, being at play when we're talking about these teenagers, right? So I have to, I have to wrap up. So just to, to conclude, I mean, a, a conclusion of what we, what I showed you here, that youth in drug trafficking gangs, they tend to come from slightly worse socioeconomic background when compared to this average youth in the favela. The career inside the gang seems to be determined mostly by displays of courage and attachment to the gang. Schooling seems to be correlated with, a, with age at entry, but actually for those who join, schooling is not related to the probability of exit. I didn't show this to you, but, but we have that in the paper. It's not related to the probability of death, and it's also not related to wages, right? Uh, a previous involvement with violence and poor self-assessed childhood behavior, they, these are both uh, related to a higher probability of death. And in some sense, I mean, we don't have, uh, it's more of a, I think in some sense this, this paper raises more of a puzzle than then, then, then presents an answer, and the puzzle being what's happening to this youth that they're choosing to join, right? They are indeed they're earning, they're earning average wages, 100% higher wages, right? 100% higher than, than otherwise probably they would. But the probability of death and the exposure to violence, they are just gigantic. And they know that, right? I mean, they see their friends being killed, they could walk out any day, as, as, that's the evidence. And they know the history they're living in these communities they see what's going on right so uh and if you look at a lot of their settings there are similar patterns that have been documented even in the u.s in high in high risk neighborhoods right so i think in the lab in Bangladesh, this is not the main paper but it's a smaller paper they show that youths growing up in the project in south chicago they have a 10 percent probability of death over 10 years which in some sense is more striking because they're not focusing only on gang members, right? They're just focusing on youths growing up in these very high risk projects, right? Uh, it is difficult to imagine that non-pecuniary motivations are not playing a role, right? There's some, some, some idea of status, of belonging, of being in a dominant position at that point in life. Uh, and I think probably that's the, the direction which we, we have to go. Uh, and I think the key point that comes out of this is that this involvement, even if it's temporary for most, it can lead to very dramatic consequences for some. And, and Mika has some work showing that exposure to illegal activities during teenage years lead to a higher probability of criminal involvement uh, throughout life, right? So there seems to be this key moment in the life cycle that we, if possible, we should try to, to break. Right, and some work I think that promising work that people with Chris and other people, so Lelis and 
Sarah Heller, the, the issue of after school um, uh, programs and cognitive behavioral therapy that some sense seems a little promising. Uh, but I think there are lots of other people here who know more about this than, than myself. This is just to try to end on a on a more positive on a more positive note. But I do think that there is this issue of of teenage involvement that we we have to understand more. And obviously, I think step back from from a purely uh, economic perspective. I guess. Perfect. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you, Chris, uh, and thank you, Mika, uh, Mika, too, for uh, for inviting me, uh, Rodrigo. Um, I think I we already discussed about this paper a few times. This is a great work. Um, as mentioned, there is not much work that look inside the black box of what is organized crime or gang violence, especially for youth and especially in Latin America. And uh, and many times we step back and we think gangs as uh, this monolithic uniform uh, kind of construct that is the same across country, across context. And it's clear for you know that that's that's not the case. And so there is a sense in which if you want to take policy and policy prevention and any policy discussion, just even understanding from the motives to uh, the potentially predictive risk factor becomes then then a key. Um, you know, I've done some work in Honduras. I know uh, that Mika did some excellent work also in El Salvador and and Chris in Colombia. And, uh, and it's clear to me that some of the underlying reason to join a gang are actually different. Uh, Rodrigo just mentioned, I think at the very beginning, this seems to be a choice. They can enter, can exit. Is there, you know, there is fluidity between inside and outside the gang. But in other contexts, as this seems to be the case in El Salvador and Honduras, it's not a choice. This is very much part of the social contract, and especially uh, it's a large part of, of not being a choice is that these gangs actually are you know, are very strong social cohesion. Sometimes in specific neighbor and specific area, they're actually running the neighbors. And this is actually true also in the favelas. We think of them completely as an unlawful and violent organization, but in Rio and the same is true in El Salvador and some area of Mexico as well, they provide legal service, they provide, you know, placement uh, work, even in the, uh, the legal market, not only in the legal market, they provide uh, you know, cable service in the favela. So there is a sense in which this notion that gangs are just is a, a illegal actor that don't offer actually social um, or public goods is actually plays a huge determinant role in understanding one, some of these dimensions of prevention, but also what is behind some of the joining in some of these, uh, um, uh, these gang, this organization. I think the economic motive can be strong uh, however, that's not a finding we find in Honduras, especially with young youth. Most of them don't earn much. And again, maybe then the reporting, I don't want to make too much of, especially because it's very difficult. That's the other thing I want to emphasize. Very difficult to ask, uh, answer, ask this question. You know, very quickly in Honduras, we were doing the survey. We have to drop even just the question, you know, are you do you know anybody affiliated with a gang or you're, you know, uh, do you know anything about a gang? You know, between three hours we were following from gang member asking what we were asking about gangs. So even just having this rich and wealth of data that uh, Rodrigo is working with is incredibly valued, valuable. So again, as mentioned, the economic motive is there. Sometimes we have coexistence of legal and legal activity, uh, in particular because most of these youth are dropouts and don't have kind of high wage potential. So for them, it's very much not all unemployment is pretty equal. And this is very much youth that have very often, um, you know, low skill. And if they have an economic, um, an illegal economic employment tend to be informal, low skills, doesn't offer, offer skill development. The other um, mention that, um, the other dimension that Rodrigo actually highlight is this notion of identity and belonging. You know, these are, whether it's because people come from certain neighbors, whether they're, they're history or whether because there is no an alternative, there is a sense in which they feel themselves reject. We t we've been told, oh, I'm not looking for a job outside my neighbors because I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be seen as a, a gang member or somebody that is problem because I come from this region. So there is a sense in which this um, the social division runs deep, is internalized, just as the problem child is internalized, but also the rejection of all these traditions. And so there is a sense in which this dimension identity or even social belonging is actually very, very powerful. Um, very little is known about exit. I know there is a, there's a study actually in Salvador, in El Salvador that said there are three ways you exit, well, four, you exit a gang. One, you negotiate it 
um, especially if the church plays a role. Uh, the other one, you completely age out of it. Age is actually this transition, this life cycle transition uh, seems to play a role. Uh, the third, uh, and, and, and the third one is actually the extremely violent way, as Rodrigo said, most high mortality rate among this population is extremely high. And so there is a sense in which now you have, or you get a negotiator, or you can the, the role of a powerful institution to negotiate your exit, but are other ways to exit, especially I think in the context of um, the gang structure that Rodrigo was discussing, if this is a choice, what is the exit? Where are the mechanisms, not only the make you, and I know that you cannot look at this into with your data, but there is a sense in which where are the, uh, the mechanisms that allow to exit? Is income opportunity, is aging out, is social transition, life cycle transition, again, where are those levers? Um, the other things I wanna, um, in terms of, um, I think the other things we need to think about is like, well, once we have gangs, what is the disaster strategy, but you know, what can prevent? Uh, joining a gang. Again, this is in the context where not all gangs are created equal, not all contexts are created equal, and sometimes it's not a choice. School seems to be an incredibly powerful entry point, uh, but cannot be, I think the more I read this literature, and I'm happy to be challenged on this, it says that one dimension, one entry point is not all. Uh, successful, not fully evaluated intervention seems to provide a little bit of both. I'm going to provide opportunity to stay in school, remediation or academic help, but also I'm gonna provide you a social network there. I'm gonna provide you, you know, some alternative outlet to where to develop these soft skills or, you know, uh, self control skills. Um, and I think some successful work is done by um, Fight for Peace that is actually uh, in Rio as well, in South Africa. There, I think there's some clubs in London, Jamaica. Um, and I, I think this comprehensive approach actually speaks to the, com the comprehensive nation of what is the decision of joining the gang, but also specifically in, uh, in this context. Um, the last things, and I know that uh, Rodrigo uh, just kind of uh, mentioned the cognitive behavioral therapy and many of us, especially those that work with organizations that are not a tradition of implementing cognitive behavioral therapy in low capacity settings say, well, you know, we barely as a psychologist, how do we implement this? This is extremely costly. Is this just the latest kind of fashion in the literature? Um, I'm gonna give you some numbers. And this for me was one of the, I don't wanna say most of probably shocking results. Uh, should not probably have been shocking, but the magnitude was shocking. From uh, um, our baseline down in Honduras in, in nine barriers of neighbors in three very violent um, municipality, um, we actually include both PTSD, uh, um, depression, and traumatic event kind of uh, diagnostic. We have 56% of our youth actually report having experienced a traumatic experience. Of these 56%, 81 report that these experience involved injury, death threats, or sexual violence. And then if you abstract from these, uh, these statistics, that again, this is probably something we expect in this context. Almost everybody of our youth knows somebody that actually died of homicide. But then you ask to all our 700 study participants, you take them to the you know, depression scale, PTSD scales, and we have the 40% of our youth between age you know, uh, 18 to 25 had either post-traumatic stress disorder or severe depression. And this post-traumatic stress disorder compar comparable to that of Iraq war veteran or Afghanistan war veteran. So now think about your 15 or your 18, you go through this traumatic experience and now I'm gonna ask you stay in school, keep a job. So it's clear to me in spite that some of this kind of mental health intervention, now when we think about human capital intervention with the schools or mental health, they're not just you know, it's nice to have, and I had this discussion actually with the Minister of Education in Brazil, it's something that becomes a must. Again, it's very difficult to learn and stay focused if these are the level, and these probably are also underreporting um, um, to say. So this, to me, this statistics, if anything, is what is most convincing or what important for having wealth structure, not just soft skill, but also mental health intervention. Um, Laura, I'm just two minutes left. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna close. Um, uh, I'm going to close on something a little bit um, um, kind of provocative. Uh, I think hopefully I, that doesn't preclude me from being invited in the future. But there is a sense in which um, if we, so 
we always, as a case in Latin America, among the experts, we do the parallel, you know, is, you know, Latin America is not uh, as a post-conflict in general. We think about post-conflict, you know, ma mainly um, um, Africa experience or Africa countries. Uh, and we try to make the case and look at the level of violence that are just comparable, if not higher, homicide rates to justify the post-conflict. But there is a sense in which I wonder if we can kind of push the analogy between the post-conflict and therefore borrow from some of the, the lessons from the post-conflict um, uh, literature a little bit more, more rigorously in the moment we recognize that, again, some of these gains are not just um, you know, unruly or kind of ruling just the labor market, uh, uh, the legal market, but they're actually offering all these dimensions. They're very much social contrast. There is a high social cohesion and they're in some cases, and again, uh, they also respond to this br broken social contrast. Whether you live in favelas, where you're young in Salvador and Zamaras for, you know, as a historical construct from the civil war, or because you don't feel you have a table uh, a place at the table, you have this parallel construct in the society and very much society that kind of function. Can we actually think about, you know, potentially reconciliation, uh, reparation, or even just bringing it into the social contract? One thing has been clear and whether it's like, you know, the, the, um, the killing of drug cartel leaders or incarceration in Salvador or even in the US, the sum of these repressive measure has really now paid off. Uh, in a sense, in part because the uh, social system uh, and the ju judicial system in Latin America also is fraud. We have actually sometimes, car, uh, you know, prison becomes, uh, you know, lab an opportunity to radicalize a youth that then join the gangs in prison and then exit. And, and so there is a sense in which can we actually bring some of the lesson from post-conflict and uh, and kind of apply to this context where again, we try to bring some of these elements at the table. And I know this is extremely problematic to governments. I kind of push this forward. I put on the table this in front of a government but I'm not gonna mention it. Clearly their eyes went you know, wide. One is exact, it's not probably something that you run on a political campaign. But to me, there is a sense in which this repressive approach has clearly so far not paid off, at least the evidence doesn't support it. And so again, from preventing to join the gang, but then the more bigger problem is like, can we coexist with parallel societal or, or, or organization that provide similar service as government do?